A few seconds later, this flash fire comes out of the front of that door where, I, where, I, where we were standing. And we're like, okay, we got to start CPR. She's not breathing. And he's leaning over his eye. I'll never forget this. And he's like, is she dead? I want to win for, for my partner. I want Amigo to like get all the accolades. I want him to get all the success stories. And so it's, it's everything. I'm always like, man, I, w- I want this for Amigo. Blue Grit Podcast, we are back. Clint McNear. Oh, I'm supposed Tyler Owen. <laughs> <laughs> he forgets. He has identity crisis. Forgets who he is <laughs> sometimes. Welcome back, guys. It's Blue Grit Podcast. Clinton Tyler. Um, we've got another cool episode this week. Before we get started, hit subscribe, like, follow, all of that. I don't ever know where he puts the light when it only. It's a mystery. I like, to keep, I like to keep these. you guessing. Hit the button. Like, subscribe. This week we're sitting next to each other. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Not sure. We have a special guest on. We do. Welcome to the show, bro. Thank you. Ryan. I'm here. Fr- Frisco K9 officer. Yes. Welcome to the Blue Grit stage. You and your partner, Amigo. Yeah, that explains why you two guys are sitting over there. <laughs> Lonesome. Well, Clint has a crush on me. He won't say that publicly. I'll say it publicly. I'll say it right well, now. Well, thank you, brother. I appreciate that. Right in front of Amigo. Well, he's here. He's just not not in camera view. Yeah. But we have Amigo down on the other side of the table as a guest <laughs> host. He's <Yeah>. camera shy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I actually don't think he is if we uh, saw what happened before we started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Amigo, Amigo before we started was sitting right here. <laughs> yeah. No, man, welcome uh, welcome to the show. We uh, we thought it'd be good to have a canine officer on. Uh, you were highly, highly, highly recommended by Tony Reich and uh, our interactions together. Uh, I've, I've always thought you were, you know, well-spoken and, and uh, Tony recommended that you come on and, and talk about your experience, what it means and... Uh, all the hard work that canine officers really have to put into the work. So welcome to the show, brother. Yeah. Well, thank y'all very much for having me on. Really do appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us about you and, and how you got in law, you to uh, work in law enforcement and uh, your, your work experience. Who okay. is Ryan? Where's Ryan from? I got to take a deep breath for this one. <laughs> uh, actually, I was born in uh, Southeast Houston. Uh, a lot of folks refer to it as Stinky Dina, but <laughs> Stinky <Pasadena>. Dina. <laughs> yep, where all the refineries are. Yeah. Uh, so I, I was born down that way and did my, I guess, my first 10 years of life down there before we moved up to North Texas. Okay. But, um, my grandfather actually was a law enforcement officer. And it's kind of interesting because getting ready for this podcast spawned a conversation with me and my dad and my mom about, you know, just kind of history and kind of filling in some blanks and things like that. And I learned that my grandpa worked for DPS and I didn't even know that. Oh, wow. Me and my brothers were talking about that the other day and I was like, did y'all know that? And he's like, nope. Didn't, oh, didn't no kidding. Idea. Yeah. So he worked for DPS for a couple of years in the 60s and then. Old um, school troopers. Yeah. And then made his way to work for uh, Jacinto City PD uh, down in Houston uh, where he worked for a few more years. And he, he didn't do a full career in that. Uh, had a heart attack at a young age and and uh, stopped working. But my dad, oddly enough, coincidentally enough, uh, started his career in 1990 in Jacinto City also. Um, I was a police officer down there. Went back and forth between uh, Jacinto City and uh, Harris County. Uh, worked for Precinct 2 for the constables down there for a brief time. And then ended up back at Jacinto City before we ended up moving up here in 96. His chief at the time was offered the chief of police position in the colony. And told my dad, hey, you know, I think we should uh, maybe venture north, you know, greener pastures up there. A uh, lot, lot's going to be happening in the future. And well, so, that's no lie. Yeah. It's changed. <laughs> yeah. He, yeah. Called, he called it right on that one. Yeah. And so in 96, we moved up to uh, uh, to the colony, the whole family. I mean, it was it was tough because we were, our roots are there. I mean, they're still yeah. there. We have family down there everywhere. And uh, so that was an interesting transition from Houston. And I was fifth grade at the time. Um, you know, so our first couple of years there we were not happy. I mean, my mom wasn't happy because her parents were still in Houston and, you know, just I, my mom is from uh, South America, from Colombia. Her family is. Oh, wow. So, you know, that I think you, you said you're married to a Hispanic woman. Yeah. So, you know, oh, yeah. The, the roots, you know, the yeah. family's tight. So, and if mom ain't happy, yeah. Ain't nobody happy. And, and I think during that time, when we, after we had moved up not long ago, my dad was actually offered the chief spot back in Jacinto City and they, they contemplated moving back for a p- period of time and ended up not doing that. 
Um, so we stayed there. And I actually, during the whole time my dad's been a police officer, when I was young in high school and things, I had kind of a similar experience to you, Clint, because I got kind of picked on because of, you know, my dad being a police officer. Everybody knew it, you know, and so I, you know, you're, you know, you're the narc, you're the snitch, you know, you're, you're goody two shoes, whatever it would, was. And so, um, looking back on that now, you know, I mean, whatever, but I, uh, I definitely affected me a little bit yeah. coming up. And I always remember when I was young, my dad would always get phone calls, you know, it'd be Sally down the street, you know, Hey, um, you know, something happened today. And, you know, I, I just need some advice about police work. And I always thought that was interesting because I, that was my experience the whole time growing up. Always people calling my dad, trying to, you know, find out about something law enforcement related and legal counseling, legal counseling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I never had that experience as much me as a police officer now, but I, was, I always remember that. So looking back on it. And so I had always said because of that experience, I really didn't have an interest in law enforcement. What turned that around for me, though, was being a police explorer. And I think I've heard a lot of people that have man. come on here talk yeah. about that, right? Yeah. That's cool, man. Yeah. That comes up like every three episodes. Yeah. It comes up about it. And I, I can't stress it enough. That and uh, that and working in the jail and police explorers. I mean, I, honestly, I wish our state legislators, so if, if any of them do listen to this podcast, I really wish that they would look at some way – to fund it, to fund to get that program back and running because it, it you just went to that deal in DC. Yep, recruitment yep. and retention, right? We've got to get this thing back up, uh, up and running. We have to. And that was one of the topics up there. So I just looked up on the screen, and you're almost not on the screen. Scoot over here. I want to see you. Oh, there you are. Okay, sorry. I can see you now. We're only seeing half the man you are. <laughs> I'm gonna leave that one alone. So we were in uh we were in DC about two weeks ago, for a retention and recruiting crisis roundtable. And we've talked we've talked really since we started it from time to time about Explorers and the importance of it. And I think Nathan reached out to us when his yep. Nathan that reached out about mm-hmm. he's an Explorer and wants to be a cop. But in D.C. it came up, and I kind of thought maybe Explorer program was going away. Um, and it looks like they're trying to double down and even maybe – grasp kids at an earlier age and integrate them more um, and so that there's a real partnership there and grow them, you know, starting in 7th or 8th grade rather than, you know, 10th or 11th grade and get it to where they can transition quickly to like a PSO position or a jailer position, you know, very quick and begin that process to really try and integrate them because – if we're trying to get them at 23 or 24, I think it's too late or they're yeah. already seeing opportunities for bigger money. And, man, that's cool. I, I like that the Explorer program has come up again. The, the great thing about that, and I, I say this, the, the advisor at the time, his name's Chuck Wood. He was actually started his career in San Antonio and then moved up to the colony when I was a young buck. But he, uh, he has probably, that I can think of off the top of my head, you know, six or seven officers that are probably in the Metroplex that were Explorers of his, which I think is awesome legacy to have yeah yeah um so i when i started exploring and started doing all the competitions and things like that and then doing my ride-alongs and you know sitting there typing on the green screen running you know tags for them at night and things like that um that was i I felt the camaraderie of law enforcement and and that was a side i hadn't really got to see because my dad had transitioned at that time into administration so it was kind of a whole different you know ballpark and so I got to see the the side of law enforcement that is what I really appreciate about it still today. Um, but that expresses just how impactful the Explorer program can be because you're a third-generation officer just like I am. And the Explorer program had as much or more of impact on you than it just being a, like a family thing and growing up around it. The Explorer program had that big of an impact on, man, maybe this is the path. I think that I can't I, – that doesn't – you can't say enough how much that, that program could steer a young person. To yeah, it. and oddly enough, with my experience, they had me work on that when I started at Frisco um, to start working on getting a program started because we didn't have one at the time. And we have one now. And we have since, I think they just did a, did a conditional job offer for our first explorer that we had started oh, the program man, with. Cool. So she's coming over, um, hopefully starting the academy soon cool. and all that. So it'll be a, a nice story to, to show the circle, yep. which is what they wanted. Yeah. 
Well, when that happens, we want to bring her on. Yeah. Honestly, yeah. Yeah, yeah it'd be great. Yep. So, I, uh, like I said, I did Explorers <laughs> through then. And when I got to right before college, I was playing baseball at the time and actually had an opportunity to go play college baseball out in Abilene. Um, I was dating a girl at the time. And, you know, I was like, oh, I don't really want to leave town, you know, this, that. And um, that kind of influenced my decision or whatever. So I ended up going and working um, at, at Stonebriar Mall in Frisco for a little while and uh, got the opportunity while I was going to community college to go work for the jail, like we talked about, another one of those avenues. And yep, so yep. Uh, Farmer's Branch PD at the time, uh, we knew some folks there, and they uh, they took me under their wing, got me hired there at 18 years old. I look back on that now and I'm like 18 and I deal with the 18 year olds that I interact with at work. I'm like, I can't imagine myself again. Like thinking back on somebody hiring me, giving me an opportunity. I mean, I, I solely appreciate that, but yep. it's kind of scary at the same time yeah. to think about, <laughs> Yeah, you know, yeah. but, uh, but that working in a jail setting, especially at that time um, and the, the interactions that we had, I've learned so much. I learned how to talk to people. I learned how to, you know, have a command presence and all these things. I, I, I was, my dad was a police officer. Yeah. And I was raised in a police household, but I was an innocent kid. I mean, at the end of the day, I, I didn't know about all, you know, the things that went on. The darkness. Yeah. The darkness. The dark yeah. side. So, um, that was a, a, a very quick dive into that. Um, so I worked in the jail right, right before I was 21 and a uh, police officer position came up and I actually tried to go to Frisco. My dad was like, Hey, you know, Frisco is a great, is a place that you probably want to be for the future. And so I had called up there and they were like, now we're really not looking at, you know, bringing anybody on to send to the Academy and that kind of stuff. And so I was like, okay, well, farmer's branch ended up giving me the opportunity. I went to the police Academy in 2008, um, regional police Academy up there, 53 people. I think I heard y'all talking recently about, uh, some some of the police academy sizes and things, and so it, that's actually on the larger side. It seems yeah. like these days. Yeah. Yep. Um. So I went there. You know, met some folks. There's not a lot of people from that class that are still cops. Oddly enough, wow. <laughs> mine either. Yeah, mine either. I was the only one I think out of my class that that, that didn't get arrested <laughs> or quit or, or stayed in law yeah. enforcement for for whatever reason. Yeah, and I I think. I, I bring that back to the Explorer stuff. Like, I, I had a leg up when I started there. I had been, you know, around penal code and, you know, all these things that they expose you to and the culture and all that. So, I, and the jail. You know, I knew what I was getting into a little more than some of those For folks. sure. So, that helped. Um, but I hit the ground running when I, I got out of field training. Um, Farmer's Branch was a fun place to work. I got a lot of experience there. I worked uh, east side of Farmer's Branch for most of my career uh, that I was there. Like and butting up to like Richardson? No, not that far. So right where the tollway, 635 and Midway. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. So actually what I dealt with the most were folks coming from Addison, which is a small little town, uh, four square miles, I think, or something like that. It's got a little airport in it, but it's full of bars. And at the time it was real, real full of bars. And so I, I uh, got real good at DWIs for sure. Um, but that was a, a great place to work. I had some great experiences, and uh, I met my wife there while I was working. So she started working in 2010. Um, I she was a cop? A, yeah, she's a cop. That's right. That's right. Yeah, so she uh, she came on, uh, from moved from Missouri, worked for CPS there, and uh, I was a field training officer at the time. We paired up a few days that she had to ride along with me just because I was a stand-in for her you know, trainer that wasn't there. And so we have those stories looking back on now that, you know, she's like, I was so fed up with you, you know, <laughs> you know, you had the radio blaring and wouldn't give me the, the computer to look at or this or that, you know, it's funny to take a look at the first sight. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that definitely was not, definitely was not. But, uh, you know, we, we put a lot of people in jail together and, and we have those stories, you know, not a lot, not a lot of folks do. And yeah. so it's, it's a marriage a, made in heaven, put <laughs> people in jail together. Man. Yeah, <laughs> I, I tell the people I met my wife in jail. So, you know, but uh, so uh, if we were going to progress any further in our relationship, I was, I was going to have to get out of there because of the nepotism that they have. So I, uh, in 20, I got my degree in uh, 2013. And actually, that was the reason I got my degree backing up. The legislature had passed, I think in 2009, uh, a bill 
that gave peace officers the ability to get a criminal justice degree at no cost. Yeah. I took advantage of that. Nice. I had a few, you know, I had done my community college hours, this and that or whatever, and kind of let it slide. I was doing my you know, time as a new officer and was ate up with that. And so when I finally saw, I said, like, you know, I need to get this degree. It's an opportunity. So my city paid for my books that I worked for at the time. And, and the, you know, the state paid for the degree. I got it online from Tarleton in Stephenville. First time I stepped on campus was graduation day. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, but Hey, I've got a coffee mug I drink from all the time that says Tarleton state university <laughs> alumni on it. Yeah. And, uh, a piece and of paper on the wall. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, but, uh, so then in 2014, I applied for Frisco <clears throat> and, uh, got hired on there pretty quick. I had a guy that I actually worked with, uh, from farmer's branch that had left about six months before me and gone there. So he's like, man, it's great here. One of the guys that worked with my dad at the colony also was working there and they're, you know, everybody's singing praises. This is the place to be. It's going to grow. Okay, cool. So I go there in uh, spring of 2014 and get hired on. And the chief at the time when I got hired, he was like, yeah, we'll have you here, you know, but uh, just so you know, we don't have canine program. We don't have tasers, you know, you know, whatever, if you're okay with that. And I was like, yeah, that's fine. It is what it is. Um, and I got hired on and uh, started my career there, and I've been there since 2014 now. I started uh, Garland in 94. Garland's an older city. It's landlocked, and it was a good place to be a cop. I mean, it was busy, and it, it was really Western, but my dad worked at DPD. He was wanting he was wanting me to think forward thinking. So probably 96 or so. He called me and said, man, I, I really want you to consider going to Frisco. I know, I think he knew the chief. He knew somebody at Frisco. Well, at the time, Frisco was working out. The mall wasn't there. The police station was working out of like a trailer that used to be Willie Nelson's. <laughs> that was that was the jail. The jail. Yeah, that he had brought for a concert up there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they were working out of that while they were trying to figure out where they were going to build a PD there was just several handfuls of officers there. And I'm like, I'm going to leave Garland where we have 350 cops. I'm working, you know, shootings every night and gang shootings every night. And I'm going to go to Frisco and work out of a construction site trailer that Willie Nelson gave them, you know, with like 20 officers. And he was like, but someday, because they're going to grow, you're going to be like senior top dog. And I thought, man, that's the stupidest idea. <laughs> well, then Frisco launched, and I look back, and I'm like, man, I would I would be one of the senior, because that was 28 or 30 years ago. I would be one of the senior guys at Frisco PD. I never dreamed you guys were going to explode that way. It is crazy. Yeah, I think I looked at it the other day. If I was on patrol right now, and it is counted as a patrol, I'd be like number four in seniority wow. of our officers. But, I mean – there's guys that get come here. We know we're, we're stealing all these folks from California right now and, and recruiting, which we'll take them. That we've had some great guys come, but they're uh, they're getting out of training and going to day shift. <laughs> I mean, it's it's crazy. I got I got I got to tell you all this funny ass story about my first experience. I just came to TMPA. We, the riot conference was held at the Omni in Frisco. I might have been with TNPA maybe a year, year and a half. I, I hadn't really had that much interaction with Frisco cops. So we had partied pretty hard the night before. You? Uh, yeah. Really? And, and the riot is robbery investigators? Yeah. Is that what it is? Yeah. yeah. Great so, conference. Yeah, yeah really Great good conference. conference. And so <laughs> I got get chuckled every time. What's the main road that the Omni's on? You got the, the main highway, but then what's the cross street at uh, the start? Warren. Warren. Yeah. Warren Parkway. So I run down more and I run the mile and a half and I'm coming back. So uh, <laughs> I want you to kind of visual, visually picture this. There's huge, now keep in mind, I live in East Texas. We're, we're, I'm thankful to have roads. Frisco has sidewalks that are the size of my roads in Jefferson. Okay. Nice sidewalks, freeway size sidewalks in frisco texas listeners okay i want you to picture this there are freeway size sidewalks in frisco texas that are like runway size I, and I'm, I'm 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 astonished by what i'm seeing as i'm as i'm running 
the entire side, sidewalk that is the size of the Dallas Cowboys, you could it, it's 50 yards wide. So as I'm running back this mile and a half back towards the Omni, I see a gentleman that's walking. It's courteous of me to kind of yep, to kind of let him know that I'm I'm behind him just to approach because it's early in the morning and it's dusk outside. What was that sound? Dawn. I'm, I kind of do a yip. I kind of like hip. Is that an East Texas thing also? Yeah, yeah just, a, just kind of a. <laughs> not familiar with that in North yeah, Texas. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so I'm, I'm kind of hipping at him to, to, to kind of give him a heads up that I'm coming. I can't tell he's got earbuds in. So as I'm kind of running. He's not know, yielding to my yipping. <laughs> he's not yielding to my yipping. So there's a park and there's a pond to my right. Traffic's on my left, pond to the right. He's not, he's not acknowledging my yipping, Okay. So I don't want him to get frightened as I make the approach. Well, he's not, he's not acknowledging. So as I approach him, he looks to my, I startle him as I approach. Well, he's on the very edge of the sidewalk and there is a very steep drop off to this pond. Well, as this, as I, as I approach, I want you to picture this as I approach, it startles him. And he he's he drops off this this steep embankment. When you yipped, he yeeted. Well, well, and so he begins to fall. And so as he's falling, he reaches out to me, and he begins to fall. And so I attempt to grab him. And so it looks like we're punching each other. And he <laughs> begins to fall down this embankment. Okay, it scares the shit out of me. And then he's mentally challenged to make this worse. He had earbuds in the whole time. And I'm I'm trying to grab him, and he he tries he fights me. Well, I had no choice. I just I just run off, and because I'm trying to grab him as as he's falling down the embankment. Fled the scene. Well, I had no choice. So he's fighting me as I'm as I'm trying to help him. So I was just like, well, shit. So I just I just ran back to the hotel. So I I grabbed the first first I had no phone, nothing. The first Frisco cop I come to. I'm like, listen, and I've got a TMPA, huge TMPA shirt on. I said, let me tell you, let me tell you. I'm, I'm almost in tears. I'm like, listen, my name is Tyler Owen. <laughs> I work at Marshall Police Department. I work for TMPA. This is what happened. And he just looks at me and he said, what in the hell is wrong with you? And I was like, I didn't assault that guy, but I promise you, if you get a call of a guy running that assaulted a man that was running anyway, that was my first Frisco experience I, I with the like Frisco I'm Cup. Going to solve some at-large case that no. we have open oh. right now. <laughs> no, but anyway, that's my that's my Frisco. <laughs> put fled the scene, locked his keys <sighs> in his truck. Yep, yep. <laughs> yeah, that's a new one for me. Yep, I yipped and he yeeted. Yeah, yep. Anyway, all right. Well, moving along. Yeah. So. Uh, Started guess, out on patrol? Yeah, I started on patrol in Frisco. I was actually didn't do that very long. I had to do field training. We we uh, tend to have guys that come with experience, and we're like, hey, you're out. You know what to do. Let's go. You're going to yeah. be in field training officer now because uh, we, we're we cycling folks. You know, you'll yeah. be on off the street a couple, uh, a couple of days, and then uh, you're going to a specialized position. Amigo's making his appearance here. Hey, what's up, He wants Amigo? to remind us that he's here. He hurt my yip. Yeah, that's that's probably very very accurate. <laughs> so uh, anyway, I moved into our community services division not long after I, you know, hit the street. I and what exactly does that? I mean, obviously, community services division. But. I, I like to call it the junk drawer of the police department. Honestly, it's kind of uh, anything that needs to be assigned something that doesn't have a place to go goes gotcha. to that office. Uh, we served as the PIOs. So public information officer, we did the you know media stuff whenever stuff happened. We'd show up on scene and do the the spot on interview there. Uh, we did you know the planned interviews and all that. Social media, real big at the time. And actually, th- when I first got into that unit, um, y'all mentioned Aaron Slater on here a lot from Relentless Defender. He was teaching a, a social media class for police officers um, because he had gotten had a lot of success with that at his agency. And so I had attended that class, and it helped us a lot. Me and great a, class. Yes. Great, he yeah, does really a is. great class. Learned a lot from that. Um, Thank you, Aaron Slater. Mm-hmm. <laughs> little mention. Uh, so we we had that uh, under our belt there. Twitter and face, Facebook and all that stuff for the for the police department was under us. But then anything and everything you can think of. Uh, 
programs for the community. So Citizens Police Academy. Uh, I'm a huge fan of that program. It's uh, basically bringing in folks that volunteer to come and sit for, you know, seven or eight weeks, one day, you know, in the evening and learn about different divisions in the police department, learn about where their tax dollars are going, what they're doing. They do it for the fire department. They do it for us. Um, I think it's a great way to engage the community to help them have an understanding through our lens, not through their lens, but through ours. We hated riders at Garland back in the day. Um, I show up on deep nights one night. Chief said, hey, you got a rider. Congratulations. I'm like, thanks what I do for that. He said, it's a lady that's getting into Citizens Police Academy, and she hates the police. I'm like, <laughs> great, sweet. This is going to be awesome. Um, we get in the car. Clearly, she hates the police, and her son had been arrested. And It's a good, busy night. First call we go to, guys like spitting on me or something, and we leave the call, and she's like, why did you not rip his head off? I was ready to rip his freaking head off. <laughs> couple calls later, I sack a girl up for PI or family violence, and all the way to the jail, you know, she's chirping and talking about my family and my kids and, you know, everything under the sun. And I'm, I've am i got it tuned out, and I'm looking at my rider, and she's smoking mad. And we clear the jail, and she goes, how'd you not slap that freaking bitch? And I'm like, because we can't. She's like, I wanted to punch her in the face. And I said, yeah, I, I would love to do that, but the fact of the matter is we can't do it. And I went from did not want any part of her riding along with me. By the end of the night, she loved the police. And when we left, got off duty the next morning, she goes and found my lieutenant. She's like, I would have been fired about six times last night because <laughs> I wanted to whip everybody's ass. Y'all are doing a good job, and y'all – it was it was the most turning around experience, for I think for her and me – uh, I think the Citizens Police Academy is a great way. And that was before she even attended the class, it yeah. sounds like. So that's, I mean, yep. that's, yep. that's a great experience. And I see folks, we're on our, I think we just passed our 50th class that we've had. Oh, wow. We do a couple Lee. a year. Um, so I got to be a part of, you know, let's just say eight of them or so that I was in charge of. And I run into those folks still to this day. They they are huge supporters of us. You know, they they come out and go to all our events and, you know, well, come shake my hand. On behalf of TMPA, thank you for doing that because here's why. By you doing that and you showing interest in, 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 in doing it, it helps us and it helps this profession, but it also helps even in Austin. That This, this session is going on right now, and the bullshit and the anti-police rhetoric, you showing interest in doing it, you just had a 50th class, and if more law enforcement officers would have an interest in it, it combats what's going on just down the street from here. So there's 80,000 cops in Texas, and if more of us would do that, more of us would show interest in it, then it would help out the anti-police rhetoric. Well, and if y'all turned out 50 classes and say there's 20 people in a class, yeah. we, have, we have a whole lot more supporters yeah. Yeah. now than we did. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I did uh, – I think it was in 2017, but I, I did a reunion – uh, event when I was in there and just tried to gather as many of the former classes as I could. Oh, that's, oh, that's cool. cool. Went yeah. back and looked through all the old photos. We take a class photo with everybody. And so it, that was a neat event. I mean, you know, just see some of the folks that have been from the original classes uh, that still were interested in yeah. coming to participate. So, and that's things awesome. had changed drastically since they were in the, <laughs> the program their first time. Yeah. So, how long did you spend in the community? I was in that for about four years. Um, I, did, I picked up some ancillary task because um, if you know anything about policing, if you can do something extra, you're going to get that job right. So you know we got these guys that teach firearms and teach you know you know holding a shield and holding you know breaching shotgun whatever it is, and they they have all these different tasks. And so I had a lot of ancillary duties when I was doing that, and I had also taken up being the local president for our police association at the time, and that was kind of my big delve into really getting engaged with TMPA um, and, and learning the landscape of, of all those, I guess, the, the interactions with our you know, local government and with our members. And I've become very passionate about our members. I, I obviously don't serve as the president currently, but I serve as like a new member liaison. So I go to all the new orientation classes and sign up all our guys. The first thing I tell them, I don't care if you sign up for my local association, <laughs> But you will sign up for TMPA before you leave here today. That's, that, there's no if ands, or buts about it. Um, and I, I tell everybody and go around when I interact with folks from other states, like we have the best legal plan, uh, hands down. And I tout that 
And that's why, I, you know, my, my new folks, they, they don't have a choice. They're getting signed up. So. Yeah, I agree. That's Garland left another organization in, in 09, and we did our due process because we didn't care what their name was. We wanted the best legal plan, and that's, that's what led us, led us here. And, and I've heard time and time again stories, and my dad's told me stories of his officers being in critical incidents, and uh, Dick Brock, rest his soul. My dad called Dick Brock one night and said, Dick, I need you here. We have uh, officers been in a shooting, and there was somebody there in a heartbeat. The other officer involved in the incident had another organization, and they weren't there. So Probably still the waiting for theirs te- to Testament to, to, <laughs> to that. So yeah, Awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. When, so, um, I guess transition into K nine. So I, I, I guess I could back up a little bit. When I was at Farmers Branch, I actually had the opportunity to go, and I was a decoy. Um, oh, that sounds like fun. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but decoy for those of you who don't know is a chew toy. That's what that means. <laughs> Did you yeah. always have an interest in being a K nine officer? I mean, is, is that kind of what? Well, kind of the decoy and was kind of my first delve into that. And it makes you either. Really interested or completely <laughs> disinterested? I, I say that, but there's some canine handlers that don't have anything to do with it still to this day, even if they are a canine handler. But yeah, it uh, Plano at the time uh, trained with Farmers Branch's canine, and we had one dog at the time. Uh, his name was Kilo, and everybody always remembers the dogs' names. By the way, so if you remember Amigo, you don't remember my name. That's okay. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm used to that. Um, but Plano trained with our place, uh, Addison. Richardson and uh, I believe Collin County Sheriff's Office. They all trained together. And so the handler at the time, he said, Hey, you know, we need somebody to come out here and, and be our chew toy for us, you know, learn what it. So that was my first delve into this whole, whole deal. I hadn't been around police canine much or anything. Um, so, you know, I started showing up every week. My uh, lieutenant at the time was supportive of it. He's like, Hey, go out there and help them out. Um, and I started going and putting the big suit on. And uh, getting bit, coming home with bruises all up and down my arms every day. And I still got pictures from way back then of, of all those bruises that I had. But um, so that was really, I mean, it kind of just latched on. Well, when he retired, they opened the canine position there at Farmer's Branch. Well, I didn't have the time in yet. So I missed that opportunity. Um, and then when I left to go to Frisco, you know, they didn't have a dog program. So I kind of just went by the wayside or whatever. Um, Oddly enough, that guy that took over, he just retired his dog year before last. So I, I would just now have had the opportunity, and they actually haven't even filled the spot yet. Still wouldn't be a canine oh, if wow. I was still in Farmer's Branch. So Wow. Yeah. Have you ever decoyed? I have. Oof. Once by in a, in a, second, a second by accident during a foot chase. Oh. <laughs> Accidental decoy? Yeah. 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 No, that wasn't fun either. My only experience, we were at Naaman Forest High School. And they said, hey, go go lay a track down and uh, go run off in the woods and do whatever you can to throw the dog off, and we'll we'll stay in the school. So I ran out the back, and there's a huge green belt, and I ran around trees, and I moonwalked backwards and did jumping jacks. I was trying to do everything I could to, like, throw down a weird he moonwalked. track. I was literally, like, walking over cars and doing whatever I could to try and throw them off. So I go hide in the dark. And they're backlit. I'm looking out at the school, and I'm way deep in the woods. They do the announcement, Garland Police, we're going to release the dog if you don't come out. Garland Police. And I'm like, dude, they're go- it's going to take that dog 30 minutes to find me with all the shenanigans I did. And they were doing an off-leech search of the of for me. And I had a sleeve only. And after I hear him give, I think, two announcements, I see him – take the leash off and I look and I'm like he's not he's not moonwalking <laughs> and circling trees three times backwards like I did and I'm like holy shit it looks like he's running straight at me he's running straight at me and he freaking launches he never slowed down yep and I was like that was not all that fun that was not <laughs> that was not all that fun he just immediately rocket launched fur missiled straight at me and knocked me down and chewed me up and and I had volunteered for that. Yeah. Yeah. I'd, I still, I mean, yesterday we were at canine training and I was uh, doing some bite work with a dog and I had the, the sleeve on. And, you know, if you haven't worked with a dog before, it's still kind of like, you know, you got to figure the dog out. Is they're all a little different? You know, they it's bite. It's intimidating. Yeah. Especially it when they get a hold of you. 
Yeah. Because then it's like you feel the power. Yeah. And you're like, oh, wow, there's a lot more here than I thought. And I thought a sleeve would just be like, I have a dog on my arm. You feel the pressure. I mean, it is, it's a different deal if you've never done that. We, we were doing a demonstration. Um, I'm real big on our folks at our PD knowing what our dogs are capable of. So I was uh, with all the school resource officers in an in-service. And I was showing them, you know, these are all the capabilities of Amigo and our, and our other dog, Breston. And I said, uh, you know, here's a bite. So we had a decoy come in. I did a little short bite session. And I, and I want to show these guys, hey, you know, I lay the dog down on the ground with the person while they're biting them. I can come up there and you can handcuff the person. You don't have to worry about the dog coming off and biting That's you. That's smart. They're only interested in, in this person that they're apprehending. The flavor of the day. Yeah. And so we were doing this drill and the decoy is like, oh, it's a, it's a good bite. You know, I can feel it good. I was like, cool. You know, I'm, I'm proud of Amigo. So we get done. He takes the jacket off because it's a two-piece suit. And there's blood running down his arm. And I was like... And I go look, and there's a hole there. And I was like, oh, even with the bite suit on, the teeth still sometimes go through that Holy material. Holy cow, did yeah. not know that. Yeah. So he, he, we had to take him to the emergency room, get cleaned up, but he was all right. He's got a little scar there now. Chicks yeah. dig scars. Yeah. I do. So anyway, so that was my first, like, real, real experience into it. And then while, while I was at Frisco, 2015, um, they had a church that donated some money for us to start a program. And there was an officer there at the time that had been interested in doing it. So he started it up, got all the, you know, policies and uniform design, all this stuff, and got a dog selected, and they went and did that whole dance. Um, and so, you know, I was still like, I'm not going to have an opportunity to do this. They decided to expand the program, and I technically would have been eligible that time. And I passed it up because I had just started in the community services division. I felt like I had, you know – so an obligation. An yeah. obligation to, to, to do what I said I would do. And so I, you know, I was like, I'm going to do this. So I missed that opportunity. As I got further and further in, they, so they opened it up for a, another position because the original handler that started our program went to the fire department um, and started a bomb dog program there. So I was like, okay, this is you know, a little thought. So a couple of things that would have to happen. I was on SWAT at the time. And I would have had to get off SWAT because they train the same days. It's a lot of extra ancillary commitments. Um, so I was kind of hesitant about that. I really liked the team environment. I liked all my guys I trained with. And uh, so I was like, I don't really know if I'm going to do it. And I let it pass. I didn't apply. So come to find out the guys that put in, they, uh, they weren't eligible. So they reopened the spot again. I mean, this is when a, a matter of a few months, and I told my wife, I said, I, look, there's something, you know, it's, it's talking to me at this point. There's been something that's, you know, been around me for my, my, most of my life now in this career, and so I'm, I'm going to take the opportunity. And so I went and talked to the SWAT commander. I said, hey, you know, he was oddly enough over the K-9 program at the time, and I was like, this is what I'm going to do. Am I, in fact, going to have to get off the team? And he's like, yeah, probably. So I went ahead and put my name in the hat, and I, I ended up being the only one. So... Yeah. Wow. Didn't have a lot of competition. That increases your chances. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just had to pass a physical fitness test and, and the oral board by myself, you know. So, um, but anyway, so I, I got the position and um, what happened during that time, the handler that had left, um, and this, this leads me to this because anything involving canine is drama. Just just so you know, heads, heads yep. up. But uh, the handler that left, they kenneled his dog with a trainer that we were we were with at the time and – the dog had a medical episode. Have you ever heard of a flip stomach or uh, oh, yeah. or bloat? That's what happened to our, to our dog there. His name was Boris. And so in August of 2019, he, he died of, of a twisted stomach. Real bad thing. I mean, a lot of the vets say, you know, if it, if it happens and they're on the operating table ready, they, sometimes they won't survive it. Yeah. So it's, it's a bad deal. So he, he uh, unfortunately passed. And so we had to wait because dogs – are at the end of the day, they're police department property. So they're insured and all that kind of stuff. So we had to go through that whole process. And so it wasn't until February of 2020 that I actually finally was like, Hey, you're going to canine handler school. So I get there to my school and the first three days they had paired me up with this dog as a female dog. And they kind of evaluated and they're like, you know what, this isn't going to, we don't think this is going to work out as a police dog. So I want you to go to the kennel and you're going to get this dog. It's like fourth down from the, the line. And I was like, okay, what's the dog's name? And he said, the dog's name's Amigo. 
And I was like, you can't be serious. <laughs> And the, the funny thing about that, like I told you, my mom's from South America, our right. family is, and so I'm, I'm bilingual. We were raised speaking Spanish and English in, in the household. And so I'm like, you know, of all people, they're going to pair up a dog named Amigo is going to be me. With this half Colombian guy. Yeah, exactly. Come so, on, bro. Yeah. So anyway, so I go to the, to the kennel. It's kind of a sad deal because my wife already had gotten attached to this other dog. Her name was Artemis. And so was she, she was a Belgian like, also. She was a Belgian. A little skinny thing. And so I go basically put her in the, the kennel next to Amigo and get him out. And he's like, oh, you're, you're freeing me. And he hadn't been in the country very long. He had come from the Netherlands. And you're Colombian. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so uh, people. I, I get him out, put him in my car, give him a couple kibble, you know, and he's like, all right, so here we go. And he's, and he's dirty. He's been, you know, it's an outside kennel. He's covered in dry poop and, you know, he's just been living outside. He smells like a dog. And so we go and do a couple of tests on him. They're like, yeah, this is going to probably be your dog. Um, I take him home. Well, it's February. And, I mean, I know sometimes it may be like 90 degrees in February here, but it was, it was actually cold that day. And so I'm like, I've got to bathe this dog. I, I, I'm not going to leave him in this condition. But I'm not going to bathe him outside either. We just met. You know, I'm not going to have that be our first interaction, throwing a cold, cold uh, water hose on him. So I, I, was, I told my wife, I was like, I don't really know what to do. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to put some shorts on. I'm going to get in the shower with this dog and just take a chance. <laughs> and and she, she films this and videos this, this interaction. And we have pictures of it. But So I, I put him in the shower, and, and here we go. And I was like, I just hope this works out. Because, I, I mean, he didn't have any commands. When I got Amigo, he, he could poop and pee, and that was about all he knew how to do. And so I go to hosing him off, and it's all this brown water, you know, whatever, warm shower. But, um, but he stood there, just looked at me, got him all sudded up, and then uh, that was it. You didn't know, bite got you. him off, didn't bite me. Yeah, <laughs> I got this lavender soap. So I was like, maybe it'll calm him a little bit. So, um, but we have we we got him up, and then he and I've been together ever since. How long's handler school? It's usually about four weeks, which to me is like thinking back on that. Like what I, everything I've invested now time wise in this dog, that just is not a lot of time. Yeah. I think it's Utah. If you go up there, they have like a 12 or 16 week program, which to me seems more reasonable. I mean, it's, yeah. I meet some handlers and they've been police officers two years and they have a dog. And I'm like, I can't imagine. And I mean, it's not, sometimes not their fault, but it's what they have to deal with. Yep. But I've, you know, I've been in law enforcement for many years now. And have some experience, and it's it's stressful to have a dog and have to do your job. Well, you bring up a good point. You know, an 18-month, two-year officer, two-and-a-half-year officer, you're still trying to figure out how to take care of you in this job, yourself in this yeah. job, and figure the job out. My son's a dog. Yeah. And when you take on that dog, your, your attention's divided. Um, and it's a full-time partner that you're having to take care of also. So if you're still – you're still new enough to the job you're trying to figure out how to do it yourself now you've got to worry about a partner and what's he doing or what's is his attention divided and i can imagine the ojt really is so important because you know i never understood when we we're on a track why the canine handler was adamant that he have cover officers <laughs> and it was finally explained because the canine is only watching his dog yep. so he has to have somebody watching for him because he can't and i was like Damn, I never that never crossed my mind. I never thought about that. Yeah, yeah. I I think there's probably some folks out there that do some cowboy stuff and do it by themselves, but I would never do that if I have the opportunity. You know, if I if I have a say so in it, which I I do, um, I'm going to have somebody with me. Yeah. Well, and you reading that dog is is the reason we're on the track and yeah, head turns and the subtle things that you know the dog does. I'm not going to know, or nobody, another other officer in the department's going to yeah. know because you know your dog. And is he, if he does a subtle head turn or whatever is, whatever you notice about his personality, and you've got to be completely tuned into that when it's a track on a armed suspect or huge important. Yeah. The one, the one problem with, with my handler school is it ended in March of 2020. So, COVID. Oh, yeah. oh, gosh. So that was my first year as a canine handler. I'm telling you what, it was tough. It was tough for me just because I was like, 
everything when whenever I took over dog handling, everything I do now, even to this day, I want to win for for my partner. I want Amigo to like get all the accolades. I want him to get all the success stories. And so it's it's everything. I'm always like, man, I, w- I want this for Amigo. And when we got out of out of there, and it's like, yeah, shut down. There's nothing going on here. You know, we we'd had a few calls throughout the year that year, but you know, it was very minimal. A lot of uh, training at work, me and the other handler. Um, and so we were kind of glued together. We were, you know, he and I were trying to separate because he was a more experienced handler, and we're trying to separate to have a dog on each end of the week. And it just, you know, wasn't the time yet because of because of COVID. Looking back on it now, though. I got more time to do training on a tracking, so which Amigo is really good at. Um, and so, I mean, I guess I'm thankful for that. But it's still, I was, you know, chomping at the bit to get to work with this dog. Yeah. How many hours a week? Because, I mean, obviously you're compensated for one hour a day. Was it one hour a day that canine handlers are compensated for? Yeah, it's it, – it, But the reality, <laughs> I mean, if you could really put pen to paper – how many hours a week do you really honestly do a day? So I mean, like I'm allotted once a week to go to maintenance training. So that's part of my work work week. Uh, so every Tuesday we, we meet up a group of us and we train, we do, you know, different, that was what we were doing yesterday. It's usually on Tuesdays. And, um, but so that's a bad day for crime to happen in, in the cities that we're yeah. in usually, you know, it's uh, we had a, a seminar, I think it was probably the week that I talked to you initially yeah. uh, whenever Tony had approached me about coming on and uh, we had a burglary in progress. These guys stole some guns and ran and we had just had Clay Lacey from DPS um, come and talk to our group about perimeters and all this stuff. Shout out to Clay. That guy is a law enforcement superstar. He sure is. He's, he's taught me a lot uh, and Amigo's gotten a ride in the helicopter with oh, too, sweet. a couple of times. Yeah. So, uh, but anyway, so we had just had this class, and we had these guys run in Frisco, and they take off running. And we have, you know, 20 dogs there from around the, from around the area. So three of us, you know, hightail it over there and, and start helping with the perimeter. And, and um, one of my other dog uh, team, uh, Colton and Breston, they, uh, they actually spooked the guy and made him run, and they were able to, to get the guy in custody. I was like, pick a bad day to run and hide. Cause we have plenty of dogs here to be able to, to get you. So, but, uh, but that was, a uh, once we got past that first year, the work picked up and, you know, we've been, uh, running and gunning really ever since nineties, it was hopping in Garland and occasionally we had four dogs back then. Occasionally there'd be a Friday or Saturday night where y'all were all out of town or all the canines were tied up and it was almost like being a little kid and being home without your parents, it was a weird. It was a. It was not a comfortable feeling, because when if if there was a dog on duty and we had a foot chase, a car chase, you know, barricaded, you know, like in a alarm, and we knew somebody may be inside, we knew they were going to get caught. We knew they were going to get tracked. We knew they were going to get found. We knew. It, it was really comforting having a dog on duty. I mean, and, and you didn't think about it until. You guys aren't there, not available. Hey, do we have canine available? No, no, no canine available. Oh shit, we're gonna have to figure something else out. Yeah, they're they're an invaluable locating tool, and and I and I guess I haven't finished my point with you too about the training. So it's really nonstop. Like I, I mean, yeah. I get up every day and we we go and do our obedience training together. You know, we go on exercise. I mean, it's it's always something going on. He's always with me. Um, my situation's a little different in my house, uh, and and we'll get into that. I guess about the dog lives with me. But uh, I don't have any kids or anything, so he's he's probably got a little more freedom than some dogs would, you know, if yeah. you had kids around the house or whatever it may be. Um, but I think it's important for the listeners to understand the commitment because people think y'all just roll around with a good-looking dog, and that's, you know, that'd be easy, man, just roll around with a freaking cool dog and taking him to the vet, ensuring he's always, you know, taken care of, ensuring he doesn't get out and bite a neighbor. And, I mean, there's a lot goes on to taking on that partner. When I first found out I was going to be doing canine, I built a board on board privacy fence. It was the first thing I did. Yeah. Uh, Cause the, the city came and installed a, a run out in the backyard and there's a dog house. And I was, I always laugh, but I tell everybody, you know, Migos from Frisco, he's well taken care of. He's got <laughs> air conditioning in his dog house. So 
Um, well, I'll be honest with you. I mean, I, I mean, I was stupid back when I started in law enforcement. You were to think. You do not know you were. Was okay. Was all right. Um, you know, I had the mindset that canine guys just, you know, they didn't do shit. That they were, you know, uh, they weren't on patrol. They were gifted. You know, I mean that they didn't do they didn't do anything I mean, because you don't you, they, y'all canine guys didn't have to answer patrol calls. They they're you know they they were catered to by the administration. But then you really look and as you mature in your law enforcement career, you really start looking at really what they do. You know, they 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 bow, they they're, they're structured in the swing shifts, so. <laughs> They're not. They're working in the balance with with day shifts and, and 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 evening shifts. They're working all the time. They are not responsible for patrol calls because they're supplemental to patrol. So I mean, there's there's things that they do, and, and I was I was ignorant, you know, as a young patrolman. <laughs> so he was, he's known. So that's why I'm trying to really push push what I'm what I'm asking you to really dive into really how much y'all really work. Whenever I I didn't see him at work whenever I was whenever I was on patrol was well it's because they were at training with other canine handlers from other agencies and they were not in the city that I worked at then. Uh they were at other cities working or training. So Yeah, and that's our experience too. Like we normally the the trainer that we have is a police officer in a nearby city. And he, we usually are in that area because our equipment's over there. Right. You know? So, you know, that those guys that I work with see that. But, you know, we've educated them. Like, hey, you know, if you need us, we'll come over there. And I've, I've done that. I've left training and we'll come and go to right. a call. And then whenever you're not you're not at training, you might be helping another tactical unit. That's maybe a search warrant. And y'all may be helping with perimeters or so forth. That just may be y'all or another another unit somewhere else. But I, I just wanted to touch on that. And, yeah, and, K-9's not built to be Monday through Friday. No. Day shift. No. Day shift. Eight, Monday through Friday. Yeah. Yeah, and that's... there's a there's a place for that, obviously. But, yeah, I mean, a lot of our work comes in the dark. Yeah. You know? uh, that, this dog, what this dog is used for is a locating tool, whether it be for drugs, whether it be for people. Articles. Yeah. You know, I have any kind of evidence, but that, that's what these dogs specialize in, whether they're in the military or in law enforcement. Uh, and so that's how they, they keep us safe because they can locate something way before we can. The listeners – and I don't know the number, and I'm not putting you on a spot, but I was shocked. Um, there's ability to smell or scent, and I don't know there's some number or there's a term of the ability to smell or whatever, but theirs is like 1 million times or 300,000 times or whatever it is more strong than our ability. Or Do you know what I'm referencing? Well, there's there's actually uh, kind of delving a little more. Uh, I like the science of the dog stuff. Um, Nathan Hall, he uh, he works for Texas Tech University, and they actually have an olfactory lab. Uh, there's three in the the country. There's one at Auburn, one in Texas Tech, and then one Florida International University. Um, and he studied and he talks about there's dogs that can smell in parts per million, and then there's dogs that can smell in parts per billion. Oh, God. and so you've got dogs with different skill sets that are better than others, you know, and, that, and that's where you see like the, the bloodhounds, you know, uh, they, they use for tracking, uh, because they're, they're, you know, probably up in that upper threshold. Um, so you, you may have two Malinois like Amigo is, uh, and one smell, you know, does a little better than the other, just, just based on that. But, um, and, and kind of piggybacking off that when they, they walk into a place, you know, we talk about, oh, it smells like a nice burger or whatever. That They'll smell, we, we like to give this adage, they smell the, the, the patty. You know, they smell the mustard. They smell the mayo. They, wow. they smell all the different parts. You know, that's, that, that's how they delve through because all these distractors that these folks try to use when they cover up narcotics, uh, you know, we, we train with those. We'll put those out. You know, we'll have all these boxes and we'll have coffee in one and, you know, motor oil and all these different things that folks think that the dogs, you know, will distract them and, and then the dog just goes straight to the drugs. Golly. That's how Clint can do. so cool to watch. I can smell a hamburger for sure. You did <laughs> that, that the other day. Is that what you were saying? Yeah, you did it the other day. What's that? I farted. You said you, you could smell like <laughs> what, the lunch, the dinner. <laughs> Be honest. We're family. I apologize. <laughs> uh, so, parts, parts per million. <laughs> 
In talking about the commitment. <laughs> That's I'll, not commitment I'll, I'll there. Get your, I'll get your segue for you. But, uh, but yeah, so a lot of folks don't know the dog lives with me. Really? Yep. What, they think he just stays at the PD? I, I think there is – the military probably has lent to that, folks thinking – because you know they that's where they do with, with the dogs they'll have them at a kennel or whatever and they'll have a kennel master um you know unless they're deployed or whatever but you know in law enforcement they they yeah. live with us and a lot yeah, of folks I think don't that's that. important yeah. i mean that's the bond and that's man i think that's so important and call out i know you guys are susceptible to call out and we I'm, we preach about pack instinct in my my training group that's one of the instincts the dogs have and, and operating as a pack, and that's kind of a story you're telling about the, the dog running by you, chasing a bad guy and looking at you and keep on passing you up. That falls into that. We train with these guys, and they understand the dynamics of, you know, if I'm in a stack in front of a door and I've got my dog laying down five people deep and he's looking around, here's us giving commands to the bad guy, hey, police canine, come out. You know, My dog bypasses all those people and goes in he understands that he's seen that picture before and that's that's part of that he's like, this is my pack here i'm here to work with them and the same reason that i can go and we engage with somebody and lay them down on the ground and the dog's not going to let go and go attack somebody else that's he's amazing, apprehending this man. person so that's part of that pack instinct that we're really delving into when i first got amigo he i hand fed him for the first four months everything he ate was out of my hand all of his kibble building that bond Oh, wow. That's amazing. That's pretty cool. The stories you're referring to, I'd never been around canines. Um, and one of our old canine handlers, Brian Griffith, would bring his dog into lineup at night. He'd walk around and let everybody love on him. And we'd always ask him why he did it. And he said he was letting the dog smell us and see us and get to know us and building the pack mentality, mm -hmm. which when you said it, it makes complete sense because dogs are pack animals. I kind of thought it was cheesy because I was young and thought I knew everything and um, in a car chase one night out of radio or radio communication didn't work and guy bells out running down a grass alley out of a stolen car and I'm chasing him and uh, I hear <laughs> and I'm like oh god the freaking dog's about to nail me and I'm going to go end over end and I look over and Bear's running along beside me and he just kind of looks me up and down and takes off and launches the bad guy and I ask Griff afterwards why he didn't maul me and he's like dummy because he he knew you. He had seen you before, smelled you before. He knew, he knew, he knew you weren't the the guy. And I'm thinking, man, that's insane. That on the fly, a dog in the dark in a strange place is processing. Nope, ugly guy, but not the right ugly guy. Let me go get that other one. And that's crazy how smart they are. Yeah, yeah. it's cool. Very intelligent. Yeah, but so they they come home with us. So he's got his place there. I have a crate inside the house that he. That's where he spends most of his time whenever I'm often heard too many stories of people breaking into folks backyard and poisoning dogs and things like that so i've you know i've got a police car at home and all that so now do you do you, am i personal i could see where being too friendly and too loving for that it, there's got to be a balance do you not agree at the, home there does but here's the thing i i tell f folks this all the time so whenever i was a, you know, in Farmer's Branch, and I had experience with Kilo. Kilo, they brought him into briefing every day. Everybody pet on him, all this stuff. Uh, you probably, and, and actually I was kind of surprised that you said this about your handlers at Garland, but there used to be a time whenever there these these folks were like man eaters. They would call them, you know, they right. were they were at the end of the line barking. They're like, can't look, don't even look at them in the eye because <laughs> yeah. they're so vicious, you know, or whatever it is. And those dogs exist out there, um, but we don't want those dogs in our profession. So whenever we go and we, we, we're going to go pick a dog out, we're testing them for all these different things. And they're uh, what we call environmentals. We want to make sure that they, they could sit on this table and not freak out, you know, or walk on a slick floor. Um, but with that, too, we want to check their what's called social aggression. And I want to make sure that within that pack that they're not going to try to attack me if I give them a correction or if I tell them they can't do something. Um, I want them to be able to go and, and lay next to you and not have a problem. Yeah. You know, or if you accidentally step on their tail when we're doing a building search, you know, I don't want them to turn and bite you. So we test all those things. And so with that goes, you being comfortable around the dog too. Right. I'd rather you love on my dog, you know, get some kisses from him or whatever it may be and give up a little bit of that 
you yeah. know, aggression, yeah, if you will, that how folks sense. will re- refer to it. Not be so robotic. Yeah, I, I want our folks to feel comfortable. Yeah. Well, and, and handlers have told me in the past that even the dog, after a little tenure, understands home time. And when I get in that car, like you can see the switch flip, like – I'm yeah. on duty now. I'm at it's it's work time now. That there's a I I follow a lot of canine podcasts in my off time, and and I actually I want to tell y'all something about podcasts in a second. But I I was listening to this canine podcast. These guys that I follow, and they talked about how you know there are stages within getting a new dog. Like Amigo did sleep outside at times when I first got him, and you because know, I'm getting to know this dog and all this stuff, and we've slowly transitioned to him being in more of an inside dog permanently. Uh, but that took time, you know. I had to we had to build some rapport and trust and all that kind of stuff, and um, so I, I think that that kind of goes exactly to what you're saying. What I was going to tell you about podcasts, and I meant to say this earlier, is it's funny sitting here with you two because if folks that actually listen to podcasts regularly. I think you become very picky about what you listen to. Yeah. Because, you know, you're basically like I me. Mean, you guys are with me in my sitting in my living room or when I'm taking a shower, I'm listening to the, the speaker on my, you know, counter. Don't and tell it, Tyler that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, as I was saying it, I was rethinking what I should say. But, you know, the PIO was coming out and I was like, I probably shouldn't say that. But anyway. It makes uh, you feel good. <laughs> and so it's interesting because you had to build a comfort. I mean, to be able to listen to these stories and things. And I and I heard you. Uh, I, did, I listened to your ATO podcast with Joe King. Yeah. Um, and it was it was amazing yeah. to listen to. And I and I've become a fan of Joe because of that. And listened to a lot of their podcasts. Joe's a good guy. Yeah. Yeah. And then to listen to you talk with Michaela Burns, who I know from Cops Kids Camp. Yeah. And share your stories. Like, that's been amazing. So you guys are doing a wonderful job is what oh, I'm getting Oh, thanks, at. man. Appreciate that. Um, Thank you. That's what I really meant to get at. Because it's it takes a lot for you guys to be able to not only start this up, but then start getting all these folks from around the country. I think I heard you saying you have people in Ukraine and yeah, all over the country, I mean, listening to this thing. It's so that's, It's amazing. Yeah. Appreciate so, that. Kudos I, to you guys. That means a lot because you never know if you're doing right or wrong or if it if it's a good thing or a bad thing and to hear from you, you said you listen to a lot of podcasts. We're thankful that you gave it a listen and, and to have you on, that means a whole lot, man. Yeah. Yeah. Appreciate that. Wow. Yeah. I'm kind of speechless right now. You, you want to talk about your tat and you said that you have one that means a lot to you. I'd like, yeah. I'd like for you to share with our listeners about that. All right. Uh, I'll go back. It's uh, 2010, uh, December, and I was uh, actually on an overdose call up in the north end of Farmer's Branch, and there was another officer there with me, and I can't remember what the gentleman had overdosed on, but it was something, some substance, illegal substance, and they actually were reviving him as I was there. Well, during that time, the radio comes out, and it's a house fire, structure fire. And in Farmer's Branch, at the time, we, we beat the fire department everywhere. We, we would run to hot calls real quick. So They're usually getting pedicures. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, Call of duty. <laughs> Call of duty. I actually went to the fire station the other day. They were cooking a roast. And I was like, really? In the slow cooker. I was like, man, it's good treatment here. But uh, so I, I heard the call, and it said there was possibly somebody trapped inside. So I, was, I told my partner, I said, hey, are you good here? I mean, the fire department's handling this, you know, dealing with this person. And he's like, yeah. So I'd book it south down the road. And it was in the south end of town. So I had to go straight down this main thoroughfare. It was under construction. I remember there was another officer that got in front of me. We were running lights and siren. And there was some cones set up for construction right at this main intersection. And this car cut us off. And, you know, I'm giving them the business. And... um so we pull up, and this was before body cameras. So we just had the in-car camera was all we had. And I think we had just switched to digital even. It was right after VHS had come out. Um, God, so, I hated VHS. Yeah, well, I had to erase the tapes when I worked in the jail after the <laughs> oh, time was God. over. So I remember doing that. But 
So we, I come down, I pull up on scene. The canine officer was actually the first officer on scene at the time. He had pulled his squad up. And these, uh, this, this end of town had these houses that probably sat on like a half acre lots. They're pretty big. And they're old ranch style houses. And so, I mean, you get there and the whole thing, I mean, smoked up. You can see flames coming out the back of the house. I'm like, oh, this is, this is a real fire. And um, so I see him and he's at this, his squad car, which we'll talk about in a little while too, I'm sure. But his squad car is directly in front of the door. It, the door's open and he's looking inside yelling. And so me and the other officer, we both pull up there, run up, and they're both yelling and screaming. And I, I get down on all fours and I look down and the smoke's all the way to the ground. I mean, so you can't see anything in there. <clears throat> so I look and I'm like, I start coughing because the smoke's coming out. And I look over. And I'm like, that's the front door. This isn't the front door. There's another door on the side that's got like a walkway up to it, but it's actually facing to the, the for, for you SWAT guys, the B side of the house, the Bravo side. And so I said, that's the door. That's the door. Well, these two guys go over and, and Tyler, I was, I was a little bigger than you were at the time. I was probably about, I was pushing 270 probably at the time. Um, so they try to open the door, kick it or whatever, and they can't. So I'm like, get out of the way. So I, I barrel down the little walkway, and I shoulder the door, and you hear the, the, the deadbolt fall down. Cling, cling, cling. I mean, I, I distinctly remember that sound. And I'm like, okay, the door's un- open, but the door won't move. So I keep pushing, I keep pushing. I'm like, the person's on the backside of this door. So we finagle that door, push it open enough, and we're able to grab hold of her. And we drag her out and pull her into the front yard, probably about about 30 feet from the front door and in the grass. It wasn't a few seconds later, this flash fire comes out of the front of that door where, I, where, I, where we were standing because we had just filled that area with all that oxygen. So I go, and she's not breathing. Uh, she's half-dressed. She was, she was using the restroom at the time when this all started. And she was in her 80s. Well, what I didn't know at the time is her husband was standing outside there, right by where we were in a rope. And so he's coming over to us, and we, you know, we're starting to assess. It's just us officers still on scene. And we're like, okay, we got to start CPR because she's not breathing. And he's leaning over us. I'll never forget this. He's like, is she dead? Just keep saying that. Is she dead? You know, and we're like, I'm, Little, first of all, I didn't have a lot of life experience at the time anyway, so I didn't know how to deal with that problem. I'm like, I'm just trying to deal with this lady right here. It's all I know how to deal with. Ammunition starts going off in the house because of the fire. Um, firefighters start showing up, but the firefighters are going to deal with the fire because the paramedics hadn't quite arrived on scene. So we're over there going and going. Um, never were able to revive her. Um, so we sat there and worked on it, worked on it, and I think we swapped. My lieutenant at the time came out. He he took a session of, of, of doing compressions. The canine officer, me, we all had our you know an opportunity, I guess, if you want to call it that. All the while, while her husband's standing over us, just watching all this happen. There was a paramedic that actually lived down the street that came down. And it was the first time I had ever seen anybody take, um, I don't even know what it's called, but that little device where they drill into the knee. Uh, for a line. Yeah. I'd never seen that before. I just really remember that because it was, you know, just, I was really in the moment, I guess, at the time. And uh, so they, they finally got the paramedics there. They they work on her. It seemed like forever. I mean, it was, it was probably 45 minutes we're on scene just, you know, dealing with this because there's fire trucks everywhere and the house is fully engulfed. It's, there's a, um, I think there was another garage that was off to the side of it too that had caught fire. So we, uh, they load her up and get her out of there. And unfortunately, she, she didn't make it. So then I remember we we're trying to clear the area for these guys to work on this fire. And I go over, and we had been enough in there that we're all, like, hacking up along. I mean, we're coughing like crazy. Um, and I go to move the, the canine squad because it was right in front of the house. I mean, it was right in the way. So... I made a boo-boo, and I 
almost hit a fireman. He starts slamming on the back of the trunk when I'm backing up this thing. I was in the K9 squad, like I said. And then I run over a fire hose. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> to make it all worse. So I committed the all time firefighter sin uh, of running over this thing. But anyway, so we, we, we cleared out of there. I got sent home after that. We were, I remember taking a shower and all this black soot coming off of me. Um, and I, I just remember like every time I cough, it was just black, you know, uh, from, from all that smoke inhalation. And I mean, I didn't have to be treated or anything. I got a little oxygen on scene, but it's just one of those things that one of those weird calls that, you know, maybe some people chalk up to nothing. That's always stuck with me. Um, and I would, when I still worked there that they tore that house down and it was a slab for years. So I'd go by there, you know, every year on the anniversary and just, you know, go by and just look at it and kind of remember. Um, and the, one of the other officers would always go there with me too. And so I got a, I got a tattoo that's up on my arm up this way and it's just full of fire. Um, just kind of was a reminder to me about it. Um, uh, I mean, like I said, it, it definitely impacted me. I don't know if it impacted me negatively or positively. It's just one of those things I always think about in my career. That's, um, may have been maybe my first, I don't even want to call it a critical incident, but it, the way I looked at it was I could have been standing at the door when that flash fire came out, if we would have taken any longer to get her out. And I think there was a fireman that told us the marshal said, if you would have been in front of that door, you would have been gone. Damn. Um, and so that's, that's probably one of the things that stuck with me the most about it. Um, I think it's cool that you go back on the anniversary or did, did whenever you worked at farmer's branch, I think it speaks volumes for your character and your heart. And, uh, I think it also speaks volumes for your passion for the job. So, well, and, and our non-law enforcement listeners, you know, we're often thought of as robots or yeah. storm troopers or, you know, whatever it is. And I think that's a great example of somebody that cared. I mean, it affected you. It cared. It wasn't your family member that lost their life, but it affected you. Somebody lost their life. It, you vividly recall every detail of it, and most people probably don't go through, most all people go through life without going through trying to work on somebody that doesn't make it and almost losing their life in, in the midst of that. And the fire is a scary-ass thing. Yeah. I've, I've only water. been around one really, <laughs> yeah. one one time fully involved and i got there and thought man this firefighting deal is probably pretty easy and i'm I'm not going in a freaking burning building it yeah. scared the shit out of me and i commend those that do and uh it's fire's an intimidating thing to be around the thing i hate the most for her husband so that they were like i said in their 80s but the fire started in the laundry room with a gas dryer and so it was uh, like in the very back corner of the house. And so it caught fire. Well, he steps out of the house to get a garden hose. Mm. Comes back in. Well, by that time, it's already taken off. So he can't get back through there. So he goes around to the front of the house. Wife's using the restroom. And the door's locked. Uh, and so that's how this all kind of played out. So when, I, you know, when I found that story, I was like, oh, this all kind of makes sense how this all ended up. Why he was in the front yard and all that. Yeah. So... Man, that's cool. I, I, I think it's hugely important for listeners to see the human side of what we go through and the human side that we're not cold-blooded. Yeah. That's interesting for a cop to tell a story about fire, but. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Man, and, and as much as we joke about firemen on here, I commend them. And I've had firemen tell me, well, I'm not going to run towards gunfire when I'm getting shot at. And I'm like, I'll run towards gunfire every day. I'm not going in a friggin' burning building. Yeah. There's no... You're not. There's nothing you could do to make me do it. I commend the hell out of them. Yeah. Um, I was with one the other day somewhere, and he's like, "Dude, I love getting involved in a big fire." And I'm thinking, <laughs> nope. I'd, I'd rather go get a colonoscopy than go friggin' be near a big fire." I like getting in the bite suit and I'm taking 50, a bite from my dog. You don't know anything about those. <laughs> I'm fat and fifty. Easy. You don't know anything about those. Yeah. Oh, well, brother, you got anything else? No, I mean, I think the biggest thing is from this is you know. For canine stuff, as far as that goes, it is a lot of work. It's more work than I ever thought it was going to be. It t- I, I think it's kind of like SWAT or working child crimes. You either have the passion or you don't because yeah. it's a commitment. It is a huge freaking commitment, and it takes people that care. 
And it's not just a time commitment. You have to care about an animal. If you're not, if you don't care about an animal, there's no way you're going to be able to to be in that role. I would, I tell people all the time, it's, it's the best job I've ever had. And if I, if I have my way, this is all I'll do till I retire. It's, it's amazing. But <laughs> there's times this dog walks around my, you know, my house, my wife has long hair down to here, you know, down in the middle of her back. He's been known to just, you know, he, he lays on the floor, his, her hair gets in his mouth. So one day he's out in the backyard going to the bathroom and all of a sudden, I look out over there, and he's walking funny. And there's a piece of poop hanging, swinging from a hair that he's ingested. <laughs> and it's clogged up. And I'm like, this is going to be my job right here. And I, this, is what, this, is, this is the canine handler right here. This is what it is, the glory. So, you know, uh, that's that kind of sums it up for me. I mean, when you come home from a long shift, and there's diarrhea in the crate or whatever, you know, like that's – that kind of stuff you got to deal with. Yeah. Yep. I mean, it's, I'm, I'm his advocate. I like to tell people whatever he needs, I have to make sure it happens. Yeah. Well, and the liability you guys take on every day to ensure his well being, to make sure when you're out in public, he doesn't get lost or he doesn't bite some citizen not involved. And it's a, it's a huge commitment, but it's a huge tool, man, because I can't reiterate when I was on duty. And I would pull up CAD and I'd look, scroll down through there and see that if there's one or two canines on duty. I'm like, let's get Western. Let's get into something good because yeah. we got a freaking we got a dog on duty. It's cool. Well, I can't thank you enough for coming on again. I think uh, canines are, uh, you know, underrated <laughs> and uh, greatly appreciated. I know all the patrol guys and uh, really every aspect of law enforcement can greatly benefit from it. So I wish the camera could see because. Uh, he is zoned out. Yeah, he's conked out. Is he? That's he is awesome. zoned out snoozing. We'll be adding some, a lot of B-roll of Amigo. <laughs> Amigo. Hey, bud. Hey, well, we usually end every episode, as, as you're well aware, uh, with uh, three rapid-fire questions. So, hit it. All right. <clears throat> what is your favorite cop movie or line from a cop movie? Your favorite cop car? And favorite adult beverage? I'm very upset about this first question because up until this point, I hadn't heard this answer on the show. Okay. And then, and then Mr. Lubbock stole it from me yesterday. I have a couple of honorable mentions. End of Watch is a great one. I watched yes. that movie one time, and I'm done. That's But it's great. Yeah. Excellent yes. movie. Um, Super Troopers is funny. You know, <laughs> yeah. uh, Rush Hour is a great one. Yep. But my all-time favorite, it's and I think it's because of the way my folks raised me, is, is Beverly Hills Cop. That yeah. He, he said, and and my favorite part of that movie is when he goes to visit that girl in, in L.A., Jenny Summers, <laughs> and walks in, and the guy, uh, Serge, offers to make him an espresso. <laughs> yeah. He, yeah. He's like, See, can I make an espresso with a lemon twist? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I love that part of that movie. That, that's that, that movie makes me laugh. Yeah. Yep, yep, that's a good one. Uh, I'm sorry, but the best cop car is a Crown Vic. Oh, absolutely. All day I'm long, sorry. every That's, day. Maybe we should ask Amigo. There, <laughs> there's an episode in Southland, if you ever saw that cop show, yep. and there's a fight going on, and they hear the roar of that Crown Vic coming to help them. There is, It gives me goosebumps. You there's can't. nothing like that sound. That's a workhorse. It's probably the transmission. That roar is a transmission going on. <laughs> no, no, no. It's a workhorse, yeah. dude. Something. You can't replace it. <laughs> you can't. Most important question, though. Yeah. Favorite adult beverage? So I usually am a beer guy. Um, I'm really curious about that Angel's Envy that I've heard you talk about, but I uh, oh. Yingling Yingling is my oh yeah is my beverage. It's, it's a good, good one. one. Yeah, it's good I like one. the new because Yingling makes me feel full like I ate a meal. I like the new flight. Yeah, yeah. I usually lighter. stick with the light yep. myself, but yep. yeah, I like so, it. Yeah, yeah. Sweet. Well, this has been a good ass episode, man. Great episode. Now, I greatly appreciate you coming down. Yeah. So. You guys keep up the good work. Y'all are doing amazing. Man, greatly appreciate it. Can't express how much uh, that means and, and appreciate you saying yeah. that. And yeah. you taking the time to come down and freaking dog is bad. I love that dog. Yeah, I like him. I like him. Yep. Well, close us up, big dog. All right. Um, if you got ideas, if you got content, if you got uh, something you think needs to be on the show, shoot us an email or hit the comments down below. Please. Like, follow, share, comment, 
critique Tyler what he's doing wrong on here. Be nice, please. Whatever you like to do. <laughs> um, we're thankful that, that folks are tuning in and tuning in and uh, care about what's going on and, and the diverse content. And we're glad to see a lot of non-law enforcement folks that are tuning in. So mm-hmm. take care. Be safe. God bless each of you. God bless uh, families traveling to D.C. and traveling back home after police week. Be safe out there. And God bless Texas.